Hello, everyone, and welcome to Matters Healthcare Startup Industry Showcase uh, segment of the 2021 Chicago Venture Summit. I'm Stephen Collins, the CEO of Matter. We are a healthcare technology incubator and innovation hub built on a premise that collaboration between entrepreneurs and industry leaders is the best way to develop healthcare solutions. World Business Chicago is bringing us all together this week to connect some of our city's most innovative startups with firms that can provide the capital needed to fuel their growth. And at this forum today, you're gonna to hear from five Matter member companies with a diverse array of healthcare solutions. Everything from lasers that can destroy tumors to analytics tools that can improve radiology workflow, companies that are improving maternal and infant health and empowering pharmacists to provide better healthcare and facilitating better access to healthcare services. But before you hear from these entrepreneurs, I wanna introduce you to one of the most prolific venture capitalists, entrepreneurs and healthcare executives I know, Lee Shapiro. Lee is managing partner of Seven Wire Ventures, an investment firm he co-founded a decade ago. He helped start Livongo and then served as their CFO until the company sold to Teladoc. Uh, and he was previously the president of Allscripts for more than a decade. Lee invests globally, but is very much a Chicagoan and he will discuss our city. What makes Chicago prime for healthcare innovation? Why should investors be interested in Chicago startups? Why should entrepreneurs want to build their companies here? So without further ado, let's get started. Lee, I will turn it over to you. Stephen, thanks so much for the kind introduction. And I'm so pleased to be here for the Chicago Venture Summit. And Matter, thank you for everything that you do for our community and, and certainly the great work you've done with so many companies over the six years that you've been Working in Chicago has just been amazing, and you've brought some really great companies uh, into our community. And also, uh, thank you to World Business Chicago for sponsoring the Chicago Venture Summit. Um, I'm really pleased to do this, having grown up in Chicago, a product of our public school system, a product of the University of Illinois, and to be able to invest here in Chicago and to operate with great partners, a, a venture fund that's focused on helping all of us as consumers change the way we access health for the better is really an honor and a privilege. And I'd like to share that innovation is certainly in, in my DNA. Uh, my father started a business over 60 years ago with, with no capital. Um, he built a, a store, a, a menswear store that still remains downtown today in the capable hands of my brother that's over 60 years old. And my brother's expanded it greatly over the years. And my other brother has been in a, a restaurateur uh, for many, many years in the Chicago area and opened five or six different restaurants. So I must be the slacker in the family in terms of the types of things that we've been doing, just investing in businesses. But I've really enjoyed the time that, that we've spent doing this and appreciate um, all of you listening a, a bit to the Seven Wire story. Uh, when Glenn Tolman and I started investing probably over 25 years ago, and, and Glenn is my great co-founder of Seven Wire, but also has started many businesses in the Chicago area, and including taking three of them public, uh, we started with the idea that you could use technology to fix broken business process. But when we came to healthcare, we realized there was more than enough broken process to last us a lifetime. And this is a target-rich environment and an area that, as investors, I think you should take notice of. And in fact, it's been one of the hottest sectors for investment over the last few years, probably brought on by the attention that's come from the pandemic. So I want to talk a little bit about why venture firms should sit up and take notice about Chicago um, and our healthcare community. First, success breeds success. In 2021, there have been 10 new billion dollar companies or unicorns as they're called that's been created here. And that's almost five times as many as last year. And the number keeps growing. In the healthcare space, Village MD and Tempest, and then other companies like Cameo and Project 44 are some of this year's examples. And Chicago has terrific healthcare companies. And 
just to name a few, in addition to those that I've mentioned, Go Health, our portfolio company, NOCD, that just closed a $33 million round of funding, BSwift, Dividose, Evive, which is in consumer engagement, Higgy, another portfolio company of ours that's doing some great work in, in 10,000 different locations around the country, Lumaire, uh, formerly known as Procured Health, Dina, Zing Health, uh, an exciting new health plan, Flare Health, Swipe Sense, which is addressing hand hygiene, which is certainly something that's taken prominence of late. Veritas Health, Emmy that was started here and acquired by Walters Kluwer. Care Merge, First Stop Health. Trigger, which is in addiction identification and recovery. Now Pow that just announced its merger with Unite Us. Kaizen in medical transportation. Explore OR Surgical a company that I had a chance to meet at University of Chicago, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, and Valence, which was acquired by Evelyn. And, and so that's just a small list of the companies that have started here, grew here, created jobs here, but also have been doing tremendous work in terms of helping healthcare. And with this being a, a marketplace that's become recognized, I think you can also understand why venture capital funding has been growing in Chicago. In the first half of this year, local technology companies and startups have raised over $3.8 billion in venture capital funding. In that, Arch Venture Partners raised $1.85 billion for their fund, and Valor Equity closed a $1.7 billion fund. Since the beginning of 2021, at least 15 Chicago-based funds have announced funds uh, raising more than $4.7 billion in total. And we're so pleased to have been one of those that announced the closing of our latest fund this year. Just so you're aware of it, um, ARCH focuses on how to prevent, detect, and cure disease. And so very focused in the healthcare space. And Valor has also invested in health, biosciences, health and wellness, including providing early stage relationship capital here in Chicago. Now, with some of the successes that have occurred here, um, entrepreneurs are staying in Chicago as their companies exit, and they start new businesses. Steve mentioned that Seven Wire, under the leadership of, of Glenn, was hatched here uh, based on experiences that Glenn had seeing firsthand how challenging it is for individuals with diabetes to manage their health condition. And while we had offices on the West Coast, the largest office was here in Chicago. After Lavongo merged with Teladoc in a record $18.5 billion merger, we started another company right on its heels called Transparent that Glenn is also leading. Altogether, we've helped a number of companies get their start in Chicago. Not only Transparent, Lavongo, and NoCD, but Home Thrive, which is helping seniors live independently at home, Yaro, which was sold to Virgin Pulse, and we have another one in stealth mode that you'll hear more about later this year. Our city has been drawing a lot of tech talent. As you've seen in the West Loop, Google has been opening more offices here. And there have been many expansions of other leading companies in Chicago, and more tech companies are following. Bringing more jobs into this area is also helping to create a draw for those engineers who might have once left Chicago and gone to other areas, but now can find great jobs here. Partially, this is due to the wonderful work of P33, co-chaired by Penny Pritzker, with the support of World Business Chicago. And talent is moving to healthcare because, well, healthcare is a great mission. There's a double bottom line when you work in healthcare. You can do well, but also doing good is part of what you can achieve. And I think that attracts a significant number of those in the tech sector to come over to healthcare, even after they've achieved so much in other areas. Another way that we've been exploring keeping talent in the Chicago area is through Think Chicago, a talent attraction and retention program, helping top tier university talent find career building opportunities in Chicago. It's another way that our community is pulled together under the auspices of World Business Chicago to retain talent. Now we have some fantastic universities in the Chicago area. University of Illinois, Illinois Institute of Technology, 
Northwestern, University of Chicago, to name a few. And we've seen a number of interesting companies come from students and faculty that from these universities. And that's led to amazing discoveries and great returns for the venture firms that have backed them. We have world-renowned medical schools in Chicago. The Pritzker School at the University of Chicago, Pritzker, uh, uh, Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern, Rush Medical College at the Rush University Health System, as well as University of Illinois and Rosalind Franklin north of the city. Now, many of these universities have also supported early stage innovation, whether it's INVO at Northwestern or the George Schultz Innovation Fund at University of Chicago, they provide bridge capital to early stage companies that are getting started, but, but face a valley of death sometimes in terms of trying to move their science forward while they're waiting for those results to come in and they need additional funding. And I think the support of our community is part of the reason why venture funds find opportunities here that have been incubated and supported and have moved into a phase that allows them to be more qualified for investment as well. Our health systems in Chicago have been leaders in innovation. For example, North Shore University Health System pioneered the EPIC electronic medical re record. Now, we weren't too happy about that at Allscripts, a company that, as Steve mentioned, we took public in 1999, but we had great partners like Advocate Aurora Health System here in Chicago with thousands of their doctors and systems using our software to manage their patients. Now, the pandemic has changed the way we think about where we work. San Francisco used to be the magnet force, if you will, for a lot of innovative talent. But as you can see, it's also one of the more expensive places in the market, uh, expensive markets to live in this country. And Chicago is just more affordable. We have a great transportation system here that allows for people to commute into the city and to work in jobs in our burgeoning tech environments like River West and River North. And major barrier, Bay Area employers have left, creating jobs in other areas of the country. So when you think about Oracle leaving San Francisco and opening in, in Texas, or others like Facebook who have been opening more offices here, LinkedIn with their offices here, Google who I mentioned, it's attracting more talent and that creates a greater pool for Chicago. Now, Stephen mentioned the work that Matter is doing and I think that he, he underspoke a bit about um, the work that Matter has been doing. There are very few places where you can see leaders from our health systems, the life sciences companies that are in Chicago, like, like Abbott and Estellas and Takeda and medical device companies like Baxter who are here, who come to Matter and work with the startups to help them refine their, their offerings and to give them practical advice in terms of how they grow. In addition, the health systems work with them. And part of this reason that they're doing this is because they want to see these companies succeed. And that's part of what leads to such great opportunities for so many organizations to be working here in the Chicago area. So with the work of Matter and, and also what you see from other accelerators like 1871 that, that Matter came from or MHub, you're finding new ways for companies to be building great businesses here. So with capital, talent, affordability, what else is needed? Well, you need access to data centers. And Chicago is blessed with a significant number of technology resources that make it easier for companies to get started in this environment. It used to be that companies used to have to acquire expensive technology in order to launch their business. But with the prevalence of the cloud and acceptance of software as a service models for operating businesses, the availability of resources makes it easier for so many companies to get started. And one other thing to talk about with regard to Chicago, we're blessed with an environment that contains some of the leading healthcare organizations that represent our hospitals and our providers. The American Hospital Association is headquartered here. The American Medical Association and their leadership headquartered here. When you think about many specialty societies also based here in Chicago, HIMSS, the industry organization that coordinates conferences around the world, the Healthcare Information Management Society, 
is here in Chicago. And so those resources are also available here in unique ways because the community works together in terms of providing access to so many resources that companies can now tap into that, that the whole environment now works together in a unified way. Lastly, what I'd say about Chicago is that we're a city of big shoulders. We pull together, we work hard. This is a community where people, I think, care more about what you do than who you are. And that makes it a really great environment to work in. And that's why we've seen a number of leading venture capital firms establishing outposts here, because they see Silicon Prairie as a great place to build businesses. So with that, let me stop and see if we've got some questions that came into the Q&A. Um, Lee, uh, thanks so much. Thanks also for your kind words about matter. I really uh, appreciate it. It means a lot coming from you. Um, you, uh, you just laid out like a really strong, um, I don't know, case for Chicago, as it were, and, and what you and I and others in Chicago uh, see and live every day in this ecosystem and all the different pieces that are here. A question, you know, you spend a fair amount of time on the West Coast, you spend a fair amount of time in Israel. Um, I would consider both of those places to be two of the most interesting entrepreneurial ecosystems in the world. What's the view of Chicago that you're hearing, that you that you see when you're in these places, and how does it square with the uh, kind of reality of Chicago that you described and you uh, and you outlined? Well, I do think that Chicago is viewed as an up and coming location, especially for healthcare. Um, Stephen, you may be aware of the fact that Sheba Medical Center. Um, has announced plans to open up an accelerated research center or ARC um, at the Michael Reese site in Chicago, part of a new development there. And, and they're going to be working with local companies on the near south side of Chicago um, in the community, trying to grow new businesses that are focused on health and, and care. And part of the reason why they chose Chicago was not only because of the central location, but because of the confluence of all those variables that we mentioned. They're getting cooperation from the life sciences companies that are based here and from the universities that are based here and help from the city who's encouraging this type of development. And so there is a recognition that Chicago is a place that if you're in health, um, this is a place where you need to be paying attention. Um, and as you're looking, you're also looking for investments in Chicago and everywhere else uh, that has really interesting companies. Do you notice any differences in the kinds of entrepreneurs or the kinds of technologies or the kinds of business models that you're seeing coming out of Chicago versus other parts of the country or are they similar? Well, historically, I would say that Chicago was much more focused on, on healthcare services. I mean, there were a number of great companies that had started here that were um, like um, in the hospital supply business, uh, for example, American Hospital Supplies and, and others that were involved in, in getting the right kind of goods and materials to where they needed to be in terms of, of treating patients. Um, but that's really changed over time. And, and with the 600 and some odd companies, Stephen, that Adder is worked with, I'm sure you've seen a broader way, array of companies, uh, whether they're focused on um, biotech and life sciences and medical device, but really through now into software and services uh, that have started. So Chicago now has, has brought forward a number of great companies that are focused on not only the workings inside the healthcare company, uh, inside the healthcare enterprise, um, companies that might have been focused on care delivery and better efficiency, bill payment, and the like, but now really moving outside into other areas as well. And do you see any um, also in terms of uh, funding rounds? So the 
kind of the size or the terms of deals that you're doing in Chicago or more broadly in the Midwest these days compared to um, kind of the terms of uh, what deals look like when those companies are based on the coasts or um, or uh, also in terms of the mix of what syndicates look like uh, that get put together for for deals. Well, it's a yeah, it's a over. very interesting. It's a it's an interesting broader question, and and uh, also answering another question that came up in in the um, in the Q and A. Um, Seven Wire focuses on seed and Series A investing, so we're we're typically early stage, um, but more and more of the capital that's been coming into digital health, broadly speaking, has been in later stage deals. Um, you can see the, the round sizes more recently for Village MD and for Tempest. Um, they raised significant amounts of capital. And so when you think about the total amount of capital invested in Chicago over the course of 2021 and 2020, um, it skews towards a lot of capital in those later stage. Uh, one thing, though, that I do think makes Chicago unique and different is that um, there is a, a, a great number of firms who are willing to invest here early stage um, in seed and Series A and provide support. I think it's harder around the country for early stage companies to find capital. And Chicago is very much uh, an accommodating market for that because we tend to value innovation and we tend to value the opportunity to take risk. And so a number of the funds, um, even as I mentioned, um, Valor Equity, while not necessarily in all the healthcare domains that we, that we play in, they've made early stage investments in a number of, of companies, um, just kind of relationship capital. And, and that's really important when you're getting started. It's really interesting. And have you seen that change over the last say five years did it has it been like has that been consistent or is that a newer development i think it's a newer development uh, we've certainly seen more capital coming in at early stage in chicago it was very hard to find early stage capital here for companies that were started you know 10 seven years ago i think it's easier for companies to find capital today that's really interesting and in terms of syndicates uh, are you seeing a lot of the Chicago deals being syndicated with participation from funds on the coasts, or do they tend to lead and, and others follow, or what do those structures look like? Yeah, great, great, great question. Um, so, you know, it could be, as I mentioned earlier, that success breeds success. Um, we certainly have had no problem finding um, partners who want to invest in companies with us uh, based on some of the successes in the seven wire portfolio. And, and just to you know, mention that as well, a number of healthcare organizations um, have started their own funds. Uh, you've seen Advocate Aurora and what Scott is doing there with, with their fund and they're being active in investing. Uh, we've seen other organizations, uh, Abbott had a venture arm that had been doing work in, in the space as well. They're investing inside and outside of Chicago, but you're seeing a lot of strategic investment coming into the market. And so in terms of putting syndicates together, there are a number of organizations that are looking at ways that they can participate in what you can find in Chicago, because if they don't have an office here, they're really interested in what's coming out of this market based on the success of, of some of the great companies that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes investors in your shoes will look at the entrance of strategics on mass on mass into a space as like you know quick we should sell uh, or you know how do you view that in the healthcare space? It's uh, yeah, it's been a heady market? it's been a heady time. I mean, we're not only seeing strategics come in, but but hedge funds that are moving to earlier stage and private equity firms that would normally be later stage growth equity that are coming in earlier. Um, so it's been a bit frothy from a valuation standpoint. The one thing that we find investing early stage is that some of the companies that, that we're speaking to, the founders recognize that 
what they need as much as capital is great advice in terms of how to build their company um, and to learn from some of the mistakes that we've made or seen over the years that we've been in business. And, and so they may not get the same level of attention as those who are raising a, a later stage, you know, A plus round or B round. The market will, will cycle, we've seen it before. Um, some of that capital will kind of go back to what their core investment thesis is. But for right now, as they look to put out more capital and try and drive yield, um, that's what we'll see for the near term. Um, as interest rates continue to go up and, and the market gets a little bit overheated, I think that we'll see some of that starting to, uh, starting to fade. Well, Lee, um, we have to move on to the presentations, um, but thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us, for sharing your thoughts uh, in Chicago, for all the work that you're doing, mentoring companies and investing in companies and building businesses here uh, in the city and building businesses that are really making a fundamental difference in the trajectory of healthcare. So um, really, thanks so much uh, again for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. Stephen, thanks so much for inviting me and, and thank you to Matter and World Business Chicago. All right, we are now going to move on to the pitches. We'll hear from five Matter companies. Each one will have five minutes to pitch. With that, let's get started. So first up, we have James Lott, who is the founder and CEO of Script Health. Thank you, Stephen. So Ava walked into her local doctor's office. She didn't have an appointment, but the past two days were tough. She was sure that she had a urinary tract infection, a painful and discomforting infection that is common in women. She just needed a quick course of antibiotics to get relief, and she knew without a prescription, things might only get worse. When the medical assistant told her the next available appointment was three weeks out, she felt defeated. As a single mom in a new small town, she's busy, and she can't afford to feel terrible for three more weeks, but her options were limited. She was desperate for relief, so she drove to her nearby pharmacy and asked the pharmacist for a consult. Fortunately for Ava, the pharmacist was using a new technology platform, Scripted. Ava completed a digital questionnaire via her phone. The pharmacist reviewed the assessment and was able to prescribe her an antibiotic. She paid $40 for the visit and the antibiotic was billed through her insurance. Extreme relief was the only way to describe Ava's feelings. She couldn't thank the pharmacist enough. This is a true story and it has a happy ending, but many do not. Because of our healthcare system's complexity and capacity issues, Ava is one of 70 million Americans who often have to decide to either suffer or self-treat for common conditions due to a lack of access to care. I'm Dr. James Lott, a pharmacist, public policy professional, and CEO of Scripted. Recent policy changes are finally allowing pharmacists, ph pharmacists to do more. Today, pharmacists for the first time in US medicine are allowed to prescribe a subset of drugs and also administer common tests. This presents a vast opportunity for over 61,000 community pharmacies to offer new lines of businesses and provide accessible and affordable care for common conditions. We created Scripted, a SaaS platform, and more importantly, marketplace that enables every pharmacy to provide a minute clinic-like experience. It's simple. Patients can find a pharmacy provider via scripted.co and either book an appointment or walk in, scan a QR code, and complete a questionnaire. They'll then have a one-on-one -on -one consult with their pharmacist. Our platform allows pharmacies to quickly launch these new services such as offering tests and the ability to prescribe and bill for services without disrupting their workflow. As of today, we're offering roughly 20 tests and treatments, tackling everything from erectile dysfunction in men to rescue asthma inhalers, and of course, women's health services such as UTI and birth control. 
So far, we have our first customers in Idaho and Washington using our platform. As we complete proof of concept, we're focused on nailing our pricing structure and most importantly, consumer engagement. With over 93% of Americans living within five miles of a pharmacy, Scripted can tackle the underutilization and expand capacity of our healthcare system. At scale, we aim to have partnerships with every community pharmacy so that we bring impact to every zip code in our nation. To actually make our mission come to life, we're growing our team with talented and passionate individuals ready to make a difference. We've raised over $1 million since inception and would like to raise an additional 500 to 700,000 so that we can beachhead in Idaho and Washington. You can help by of course telling your friends. So folks, the timing is perfect. During COVID, pharmacists proved they're ready. Let's put scripted to work so patients like Ava can always have access to basic care in their community. If you're excited about this movement that's going to bring access to care to millions, let's talk about the future together. James, thanks so much uh, for that great presentation. Uh, next up, we have Chip Applebaum, who is the president and CVO, CEO of Novian Health. Hello, thank you, Stephen. And I'd like to also thank Matter and World Business Chicago for giving me this opportunity. Um, as you've heard, we developed a laser that destroys tumors. And our first application is breast tumors. And we're at a pretty exciting point in our, in our company life. Uh, actually, we just literally last week received uh, the breakthrough device designation uh, from FDA because this really is um, a, a advance in the treatment of care. Surgery has not seen any true improvements in almost decades. And we're sitting with an approval from Europe where we have approval for both treatment of benign and malignant tumors, and they accepted a superiority analysis relative to standard of care. FDA, based on our last study, actually switched us from a PMA to a 510K, giving us a very short, de-risk path to market. In FDA's words, we're doing a confirmatory study, doing what we did before, and if we get the same answer, we'll be on the market. We have a good team together that we're growing. We protected this, especially in Europe and in the U.S., and are in the midst of a fundraising right now where we've raised about half of, of a round that has a, a max of 15. But let's take a step back. A diagnosis of breast cancer is a pretty serious diagnosis. It's a life-changing diagnosis. The woman needs surgery. Lumpectomy is the most common type of surgery. She's going to an OR, being cut upon, all women have some level of scarring, a third enough to justify reconstruction. It's a week or more after surgery before she feels like herself. And the real sad part, a quarter to half of those women have to go back and do it again because they had positive margins and didn't get it all. This is what we're gonna change, how we're gonna improve the treatment of breast cancer. Imagine instead of an OR, you're going just to the procedure room in the breast center where you had your biopsy. With a needle stick, we're gonna have far higher efficacy in getting that tumor in a single pass. We close with a bandage instead of sutures, and the woman can get off the table and go right back to what she was doing. We truly think the pairs will love it too because we dropped the cost roughly in half. It really is about improving clinical outcomes, lowering costs with a vastly superior patient experience. But let's hear from a physician and patient what they think. We would then treat them using laser. Uh, just check. Can you hear that? And yeah, 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 uh, yep, we can. Or, uh, followed with uh, additional imaging, such as MRI, to see how effective the treatment has been. So we've enrolled 61 patients, patients who are very excited about this. I hope that the laser treatment gets approved because that would be terrific for women. It was like going for into a dentist office, no problems whatsoever. I think that really the main appeal is that now it's not only um, desirable, but possible to treat cancer without surgery. Um, surgery may be associated with pain, with um, scarring, uh, with much anxiety. This new treatment, so far what we've seen is that uh, there is less bleeding, um, it's much more convenient for the patient. 
So here's a look at our system. The left, it's a console about the size of an ultrasound machine housing the computer and the laser. The real key is the upper right where we have two probes. One probe delivers laser energy to the center of the tumor, and the other has multiple temperature sensors that gives us true parametric control because it's well understood at what temperature tissue dies, so we truly can be very precise, ablate exactly what we want, no more, no less, and it's a razor and razor blade business model. Most of the revenue is gone by selling the sterile disposables needed in each procedure. So if you knew someone who had a breast tumor, what would you want? We've taken this from the operating room, moved it to a procedure room. It's faster, easier, more efficient for the facility and for the physician, closing with a bandage instead of sutures. And I'll just mention one thing at the bottom here. There's data that indicates thermal ablation induces an immunotherapeutic response. We've done a preclinical study with very promising results and actually have a plan in place to try to prove this out. But with women out five years from our last study, we're seeing recurrence rates about half of what you would normally expect. So if we can actually prove that out, that's just on top of all the other benefits that we have. So we're sitting in a place where we really have a first to market opportunity. We're the only ablation device to have an approval to treat malignant breast tumors in a major market. And we're actually well positioned to start generating revenue. There's existing reimbursement codes in Germany, Switzerland, and the UK that we come under. We have the docks and the sites in Europe and in, in the US lined up and ready to go for both the trial and for commercial use. And the data that we actually develop in Europe will just help when we go for approval for clearance here in the U.S. So we're really in a great place and love to have you join the team. And if there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy uh, at another time to uh, discuss them with you. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Chip. I uh, really appreciate your presentation and the technology you're building. Uh, next up is Farouk Khan, who is the founder and CEO of Inference Analytics. Um, hi, um, thank you for letting me present today, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Uh, um, so there's an old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. However, when dealing with a medical picture, an X-ray, an MRI, or a CT scan, it is essential to understand every one of the words written about a picture. Our platform, Inference Analytics Neural Network, Ian, has been trained to understand in depth the reports written about these images. And we coupled this semantic language understanding with image-based AI to provide a complete platform that automates medical and dental diagnosis, resulting in improvement in care delivery. So who's the team behind this? My co-founder is Utku Pamaksus, a PhD from U of I Urbana-Champaign in analytics. He teaches machine learning as clinical and part-time faculty at University of Chicago. Accompanied by leading physicians like Dr. Vineet Khanna, who's a VA radiologist and other leading data scientists like Dr. Batuhan Gandaglu, we have a very strong data science team. And on the business side, we've got Eric Thomas, who supported us tremendously. And so we are a, a team of leading edge researchers who are working at the forefront of deep learning based solutions. So in the coming to my own background, three key roles to highlight where I experienced hyper growth. I was at MicroStrategy and I co-founded strategy.com, which saw greater than $20 billion in market cap appreciation directly as a result of strategy.com, which is uh, which where I was a co-founder. And then I was hired by Informatica where um, I worked with the management team to help grow the company from 30 to 230 million in revenue. Finally, before launching Inference Analytics, I ran IBM's big data distribution sector business. So. Uh, which was a direct result of the Nitiza acquisition. The bottom line here is that these are roles that give me a clear understanding of the evolution of data analytics and understanding how deep learning and AI fits into this overall analytic framework. So given uh, what I've said uh, about our platform, we should be able to solve everything in healthcare. Uh, if you can solve images and text, you should be able to do that. However, we're focused on two core areas. In radiology, there are many inefficiencies for example, follow-ups for situations that could result in cancer are often missed. As an example, one in eight patients do not receive appropriate follow-up scans. In dentistry, dentists can miss as much as 40% of what is on an X-ray. Our solutions involve two core capabilities involving deep learning-based solutions for both text and image. In radiology, our language models look at semantics to uncover potential follow-ups that may fall through the cracks. And on the image side, we have image AI that automatically detects anomalies from dental x-rays. Now, our work has 
uh, gotten significant scientific significant scientific uh, endorsement. Aside from multiple patents pending, we are IRB approved uh, with U Chicago Medicine. We have a data sharing agreement with U Chicago Medicine. We have presented our work at RSNA and we'll do the same this year. Our uh, work in radiology report completion has been published in IEEE, and we're a key contributor to an NSF phase one grant for decentralized, decentralized learning for medical imaging. Uh, on the business front, uh, we've, we're OEM'd or we're embedded basically inside Nuance's PowerScribe platform. Um, and aside from the UChicago deployments that we have, we've been deployed at multiple private practices as well on the radiology side. In dental radiology, we signed up to a medium-sized DSO as a pilot for both data sharing and are implementing a POC there. Additionally, we have close collaboration with NVIDIA from, go, uh, from a go-to-market perspective, where our data science teams collaborate with them on the research side as well. So from a total market uh, potential standpoint, uh, how big the market is, the main takeaway here is that there are about a billion scans done every year. And we are charging $2 for the entire suite of radiology solutions that we have. And that gives us about a $2 billion potential TAM in radiology. And then in dentistry, there are about 200,000 dentists. And so our price point is 10K per year per dentist. And that gives us about a $2 billion potential market in dentistry. And that's where we're starting. So the question you would ask is what is different about us? Because I'm sure you've, uh, you must, may have seen AI um, companies before in healthcare. The key difference about us is that we are coupling both text and image capability. Most of the folks who are working in image AI look at NLP as a bit of an afterthought. They use rules-based approaches. We actually started with NLP. We built models that could actually help radiologists complete the report. And now we're coupling that with an image capability that gives us a full framework and a complete platform. So at this point, we're raising the uh, seed plus round, uh, which should help us get to about two and a half million in ARR. We're well on our way. Our plan is to increase the team size to about 20 people full time, and hopefully at the end of 2022, try to do a series A. Finally, the key takeaway that I want you to leave with is that image AI has proven in many situations to improve diagnosis in significant ways. However, in order to implement image AI, you need annotated data. And doing that manually is not an option. So our platform that gives both image and text capability allows people to scale AI, and we are able to automatically annotate data that you can then use to train other models, not necessarily models that we may be embedding, but other types of cancer models, and those still require annotated data, and you can use our language models to do that. So with that, if you're interested in working with us, we'd love to talk to you and, and, and look forward to joining or having others join our team in, in the uh, goals that we have for our company going forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Farouk. Uh, great presentation. Next up, we have Larry Shore, who is the Chief Growth Officer of ClearStep. Uh, thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, I'm here on behalf of our co-founder, Adil Malik, who's the uh, CEO and founder of the business. Sadly, uh, uh, Adil had a, a loss in his family. He couldn't make it today and asked me to step in. I, I'm not a founder, but I am an early investor in the company and, um, uh, and, uh, and kind of bringing it all home here. Uh, met Adil and his co-founders as a senior matter, uh, mentor at Matter uh, just over three years ago. So I've been involved with the company now for quite some time. ClearStep is focused on smart care routing for health systems. We match patients to the right care, the right services, and the right resources in the, in the uh, networks that our, uh, that our sponsoring clients offer. Um, oh, hang on one sec. There we go. Uh, now, what got us here is a, a market context that I think is familiar to virtually everyone here. Um, consumers expect a lot more from their healthcare experience than they've been getting. Uh, outside of healthcare, we're accustomed to having transparency, ease of use, low friction experiences. The industry has not really followed that. And I think, um, it, I hesitate to say something positive came out of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic over the last 18 months. But one thing that we learned is consumers responded favorably to options to ac access care that in, in the past were not available. They liked virtual, we think it's not going away. We also think though that health systems are in the best position to drive forward with what patients actually need and want, which is a consumer first model to access care and common health services. Historically, it's, it's nearly a half a trillion dollar uh, marketplace. Uh, but what we've also seen in the last year and a half is that consumers will shop around. We know that they will look even when they have a relationship with a major health system. 
uh, they will look around for other alternatives and there are new entries coming into this market every day. Many of them are familiar to most of the folks here on, on, on the airline today. Uh, One Medical Forward, Walmart, CVS and others. What we know is that there's an immediate opportunity uh, and that consumers want things to be easier. They want it to be more convenient and they want services that actually help them, uh, uh, digital services to help them go get what they want. Um, what, what ClearStep does is it focuses on three things, matching people to the right care in the system that sponsors the service, responding to cost, common customer service requests using AI chats, and then we mobilize data that in the past hasn't been available before. Uh, in many ways, we're dealing with a new kind of healthcare consumer that's now navigating health uh, websites uh, that our clients are posting. Uh, those websites now uh, are increasingly interactive. We mobilize that data, as I'll describe in just a second, and then looking ahead, how we're going to use that data to improve the, the consumer experience. So let's focus on what our flagship does. We use natural language processing to translate free text that a patient uh, or a consumer types into a screen. Uh, we then uh, match that against a, uh, a, an ontology of the most common um, uh, presenting complaints. We then ask the patient a series of questions that are clinically relevant to the, uh, the, the, the complaint they presented with, and then using natural language processing and our chat-based uh, clinical logic, we calculate the most likely care that that patient needs. Importantly, at this stage, we're less focused on getting a differential diagnosis, which is common in the industry today. Some of our competitors are trying to do that. The problem with that is that there is a high risk that patients will abandon the experience because to get a differential diagnosis requires several additional steps uh, uh, in, in getting to a, to a final conclusion. We think that the right next step is to get the patient to the care that they need and then to present that patient with customer specific options that are relevant to the care. Um, we do this, do, excuse me, we do this for several of the uh, largest brands in the industry, Baycare, CVS, Lawforce, uh, HCA and others. Uh, and uh, the, the way this works, uh, I can't show, we don't have time today for me to go through an example, but if you go to these links for care.cvs.com or dupagemd.com, DuPage, by the way, recently rebranded as dulyhealth.com, D-U-L-Y, uh, you can actually see uh, 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 how we deploy this on their behalf. Note, by the way, that uh, in addition, CVS and DuPage, where pre presented here, are two examples of how we actually go to market. Uh, ClearStep is, is white labeled. We're actually delivering this solution to our clients in their brand. Um, we then present the patient with a number of options. This is a short list of about a dozen triage options that are end results or end, uh, endpoint recommendations uh, that are uh, mapped to the resources of our uh, sponsoring clients. Uh, the underlying source of our clinical logic is derived from a, a body of work that was pioneered by Dr. Barton Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt is known throughout the industry as a pioneer in nurse triage protocols. Um, nearly 100% of nurse call centers around the country use the, the uh, Dr. Schmidt's protocols. It's been tested in over 200 million nurse call center uh, encounters. It's one of the most highly validated uh, technologies in the industry, and we're very proud to have a relationship with Dr. Schmidt. And we've taken that clinical concept, that clinical logic, and we've consumerized it. We've turned it into a digital experience uh, that parallels what, uh, what consumers might experience in a phone call. Um, we've also recognized that consumers want their digital experience to be harmonized. They want, they want to go to a, web, a website, for example, for a sponsoring health system, and they don't want to have to search around for uh, common customer service requests. In this example, what we're showing here is that they can get care, they can find a doctor, they can pay a bill, they can refill a prescription, because we know that we want to bring together all, that, uh, all the, uh, the consumer experience that, that they're seeking, we want to bring it together in one place so that if they are looking for care right now, we can respond to that with a, a, tri a triage experience. If they're looking to pay a bill, this is the same destination on that website asset. We can also deploy this and increasingly some of the more technically advanced health systems have asked us to make this available through an API connection. So while our UX has gotten a great deal of, of uh, favorable feedback from, from patients, we know that many of our customers, large health systems as well as plans, are increasingly moving in a, in, in a direction where they have their own UX or they have their own apps. And so we're able to power that as well. Uh, and then uh, finally, we're finding that as uh, health systems become much more digital first in their orientation, they're looking to marry data coming out of the experience that we end up facilitating with data that they already have in the EMR. And increasingly, they wanna warm up that experience 
by accessing data that's held in, in their CRM. In the last year, we've seen a substantial increase in, uh, in demand for access to integration with not just the EMR to help inform the triage logic, but also access to the CRM to warm up the experience so that we know more about that consumer. We know they're, they're single. We know that they live on a third floor, in the third floor of a building without an elevator uh, and that, that what they may need is additional support for, uh, <clears throat> that, that we can then provide using our, our chat capabilities. Um, looking ahead, we think that the opportunity for us to, to leverage this relationship with consumers is super important. Um, health systems have historically been transactional in their interaction with their consumer base. Consumers want more than that. They want a relationship. And so as we build out our, our platform, as we look ahead, we, we anticipate greater demand for transparency around price. Uh, and for us to be able to do that, we need to be able to predict the labs the tests and the services that consumers will require so that when someone's uh, um, diagnosed, for example, with a condition and they ask the question, well, what will that mean? What care will I actually have to have and when will it happen? We're able to map that out as, as a care journey and then answer those questions, uh, uh, what they can expect in terms of cost and service. And then lastly, uh, we, we recognize that it's really important to begin to warm up the experience to increase personalization. Much of what I've shared already here uh, doesn't require authentication. But as consumers move from being transactional with, with a health system to actually being relational, and we know more about them, we can use the, the patient uh, history to inform triage. We can also use the, the, uh, the data that's in the CRM to warm up that experience. Uh, <clears throat> what's the, the value proposition to our health system clients and our, our payer clients is very key. New patient conversion, high patient satisfaction and retention, and, uh, and, and lower cost. Um, let me give you just one example of how this has worked with one client that we have here in the, in the Midwest. Uh, in a proof of concept that ran over about six weeks, uh, we had just under 10,000 uses of ClearStep uh, and booked 1,200 uh, appointments. Of that, about a third uh, were new patients. The booked revenue was about $100,000. This very client uh, independently estimates that the lifetime value of a new patient is around $6,500. If you do the math on that, a one third of 1200 appointments uh, translates into a revenue opportunity over the course of a lifetime with that patient of, of uh, approaching two, two and a half million dollars. And this is in just one, uh, one uh, small study that ran, as I said, for just six weeks. And importantly, we were able to do this uh, uh, with a net promoter score of over 40, several times what's average in healthcare. Uh, what different differentiates health uh, ClearStep? Uh, we have the highest clinical accuracy in the industry when you consider the number of questions that are being asked. So we're able to deliver a 95% accurate result uh, with far fewer questions than our competition. We're based on the gold standard that's, as I mentioned before, derived from Dr. Barton Schmidt's protocols. We deliver our product to the market as a white label solution. So we further our customer's brand, not our own. And then finally, we're configurable uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the resources uh, and capabilities of our clients and we seamlessly integrate with their backend resources. Uh, our business model uh, it maps to, to the... Uh, sorry to, to interrupt. I just, we're gonna have to move on to the, uh, to the next presenter if that's okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was close to time. All right, very good. I will just say this then. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and thank you everyone for the time today. Thank you so much, Larry. I'm a huge fan of what you and Nadil and Bilal are building at uh, ClearStep. It's a great company and appreciate your presentation. Uh, next up is Megan Doyle, who is the founder and CEO of Partum Health. Well, I'm Megan Doyle, um, CEO and co-founder of Partum Health. Uh, really excited to be here with you today talking about our modern approach to pregnancy and postpartum. Uh, so those of you who know the joys and exhaustion of parenthood, know that this time generates a huge range of health needs from the mental to the physical to the practical. And most families are really relying on a single provider, their OB or midwife to navigate their care during this time. And the truth is a lack of access to comprehensive team-based care is contributing to poor outcomes in maternal health, a difficult consumer experience for families and a huge market opportunity. Partum Health is really building the model to fill critical gaps in today's care. We focus on five essential specialties that complement obstetrics. So that includes physical therapy to address back pain and pelvic floor function, mental health, lactation and infant feeding, nutrition, and doula care, both birth and postpartum. And we're making it really easy for families to access this care by pairing it with 24-7 messaging with experts, 
simple care navigation, that's only a message away, and curated resources that deliver them evidence-based information. We know just with these five essential specialties, there is a huge underutilization of care today. It's also an area that's really primed for growth, both because of the expanding consumer demand and the pool of funding that's both available and expanding for things like improved employer benefits um, and even Medicaid. We've seen institutional guidelines evolving to more team-based care, but the truth is the infrastructure just isn't there to deliver this uh, kind of care for families today. We know that democratizing access to this kind of support requires a tiered model that's really fluid between digital patient education and low cost resources, simple text message support, telehealth, and importantly, in-person care, which is so critical in several areas of maternal health. With our MVP, we're using a tech forward approach that really makes it easy for parents to get the support they need. We start with a virtual care consult which is so important for really understanding each family's unique needs and building a foundation of trust to really guide them on their journey. We move to 24 seven support via a HIPAA compliant messaging app where we can check in, coordinate care and share resources with families. And last, we ensure they get expert care from specialists who really know perinatal health and that care can be delivered at home, in clinic or via telehealth, depending on what's most convenient. We are having a huge impact with our early pilot results here in Chicago. Our net promoter score uh, following more than 240 visits and consults with our providers is a 93. So patients are really loving the service that they get when working with us. In just the first cousin, couple dozen families and counting, we also identified a serious postnatal complication, a case of postpartum preeclampsia that was treated in a timely and non-emergent manner just because it was discovered during an in-home visit with us. Our revenue is currently earned through three income streams. We have monthly membership fees, service revenues, which includes both non-clinical services, doula care, and reimbursement for clinical services, which runs through patient's insurance. We also have bundled care packages, which combine the digital education, care coordination, and care services for a set per person fee. We have huge ambitions to really change the standard and, and reshape expectations for what great perinatal care looks like. To do this, we believe we need to build a presence across more than 20 metro markets over the next five years and to serve more than 35,000 families in doing so. We also would anticipate a shift into more B2B2C partnerships to scale this kind of uh, access and we see upside in both continued geographic expansion and in pediatrics and Medicaid. Um, those of you who know this area know it's a very hot area for investment. Where we believe we fit in is first in bridging between information and access to care. Second, offering in-person care with locally based teams, which is so important for things like birth doula support and lactation. And lastly, we complement rather than competing with traditional OBs and certified nurse midwives. We know that that's where most people are gonna get their care, using their health insurance, seeing providers, and we believe that those families deserve comprehensive team-based care. Our team importantly has startup experience, healthcare and consumer, as well as the personal experience of being parents. So my co-founder Matt and I have really lived these gaps ourselves and are really bringing both our passion and our backgrounds to solving this issue. We have a great team of clinical providers and expert advisors who have helped us along the way. We are currently raising our first pre-seed round and have our first 750K committed. Uh, we have a range of additional capital from one to 1.75 million. We're seeking to fuel four key priorities. The first is continuing to build traction first in our home market of Chicago and accelerating into additional markets. Second, readying the org for expansion. So we are setting up an MSO and friendly PC model. Third, growing our team and provider network. And fourth, upgrading our digital experience, both on the front end communications with patients and um, back end EHR capabilities. So we're thrilled to be here presenting today and would love to continue the conversation uh, for anyone who's interested in learning more about how we're revolutionizing maternal health. Thank you so much.
Megan, thanks so much for your terrific presentation and for being here and joining us today. And thank you again to James and Chip and Farouk and Larry uh, for sharing your uh, solutions. And thanks to all of you for kicking off your Chicago Venture Summit experience with our Healthcare Industry Showcase. Have a great day.